We've talked a lot about what society might look like and what some of the changes may be, how we're going to make these choices uh, and how we'll decide what to consume, the logistics of shopping and eating. We've just seen an example of a vertically integrated uh, offering, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more of those. Uh, I'd like to start, though, with one word that seems to have come up, I think, from nearly all of our speakers, uh, and that's the word trust. Trust is going to be an incredibly big thing for farming in the future, as it is today, you could argue. Um, so I might start with a question to, to Emma, uh, and this is about, the, the, I guess, the technological side of trust. Um, blockchain's quite interesting in the sense that it's all about trust, but because it's new, it's confusing. And so at the moment, I imagine some people would think, oh, I don't trust it. How do you think that scenario will play out in the future? Yeah, so um, it's, it is interesting, and we do think blockchain is all about trust, um, but actually blockchain is all about immutability. So it's actually about the fact that we can't tamper with a record, not necessarily that that record is true. Uh, so we still need very good data uh, validation and verification models, otherwise we get another rubbish in, rubbish out scenario, but just on a, a really large scale. Um, so trust is something that still can't be taken for granted, just because we've got a new technology um, that in and of itself is not a, social bu uh, a silver bullet. But how do we even cope with what blockchain is? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that from you know, what, how we engage with people, we do realise that there is both a product journey and a technology journey that we're going on, and they're two quite different things. Um, the approach that we have taken, um, and I'm always keen for feedback on this, is that before we even get to blockchain, let's just actually focus in on digitization. And so let's get to a, a process where we've got building blocks and we've got digital data to work with before we even you know, worry about whether or not blockchain is um, a, a possible solution for a set of problems. Um, the other thing is that blockchain is actually at its core quite simple. I know there's a lot of big words around it, but it, it's, just, uh, it's, it's just a database that can't be changed. So that, that's really all it is, and it runs across, um, instead of just running on one computer, it runs across um, a number of computers that are sometimes called nodes just to be extra confusing. So I think that we do need to, as an industry, um, demystify the technology. Um, I think that we also can realise that like a lot of technologies, um, you know, no one has an internet strategy these days. Um, I don't think people should have a blockchain strategy. You know, what we should be doing is dealing with the fundamentals and blockchain's just a tool in the toolkit to do that. Uh, Rowan, a question to you from the audience, because you're kind of our default farming representative, which I'm sure you're in, you'll enjoy very, very much. Uh, building trust isn't just about showing off the best parts of the production process. It can also reveal the bad parts. Are industries with ethical, environmental or other concerns ready for this level of trust and transparency? It's a, yeah. It is a challenging question. Yeah. yeah, I agree with the premise of the question, absolutely. Um, and I'd say they're in a, they have a level of readiness, if you mm. like. <laughs> Um, because across industries, certainly across our industries, uh, there are some that realise you don't get to choose. You know, consumers have showed interest uh, in those issues. And um, obviously every industry has impacts um, and every agricultural industry has impacts. If you're going to run a game of pretending that you don't, uh, then you're yeah. going to come undone really, very quickly. Um, have I got absolutely every egg farmer on board with that um, mm. you know, perspective? Look, absolutely not. There's a fear, much like this, opportunity and challenge dynamic people tend to one end or the other depending on their preferences but uh, some farmers will fear transparency uh, they'll think oh uh, there's people out there that are out to get us or they want to focus on the negatives and if we show them a, even a particular image of what's happening in our supply chain they'll forget all the good stuff I agree with them that there's a risk in that but there's got to be a right way to do it a responsible open and transparent way to do it you don't have to run around waving flags and look how terrible we are mm -hmm. you just have to be open and honest about um, what your supply chain is and what I find uh, without variation is that egg farmers I'm sure all farmers are so proud of what they do <laughs> and I say to them well what anyone who's uh, perhaps not on board the trust train I say well, how about we just open that up and, and tell people about it and, uh, and so do you, th do you think it'll still be an issue if we're looking at that that image of 2030 do you think you'll still be recruiting farmers by then in, as such always 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 yeah, always. yeah. Mm. I actually think um, y you might be working it's hard you there'll be mm. an accepted uh, norm that these issues are part of doing business and uh, the more successful farmers will be all over it 
Uh, and there'll, but there'll always be some people that prefer not to um, have different perspectives. And farmers are very, very independent. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, <laughs> I have. And there'll be a range of views. So. Yeah. Nicola, can I actually pick up on that? Because I had a question for Ian, and it sort of goes to um, what Rowan was saying. So, Rowan, you know, from the point of view, say, of the umbrella organization, you actually have very different kind of regimes going on free range versus mm. conventional, whatever you want to call it, right? But I was struck similarly with what Ian was saying, and I love the term, protein agnostic companies. Mm. Um, back in the day, I think there would have been a fear um, if I'm selling um, you know, vegan products that it's really gonna be very problematic to turn around and start selling meat products, for example, because this is gonna show me as inconsistent. It's gonna show me as you know, corporately irresponsible in some way. How do you think either the big guys, I mean, obviously we've been hearing a bit about smaller players, but the big guys are obviously getting over this inconsistency concern. Um, do people really think uh, the multinationals are gonna be able to sell vegan products or what were formerly niche products simultaneously with their more conventionals? Yeah, well, obviously. if you think about it, a lot of the companies have already done that. You mm -hmm. know, choice mm -hmm. and substitution has always been there. Yep. So they've always operated in different segments. It's just now they've, they have moved into this area where you know, you are getting into some of these vegan products. Mm. And that, that doesn't, for them, I don't think, change the conversation very much. It's just another product category that they want to be operating in. So as, as I look at some of the bigger players and I look at some of these high-end vegan products that mm. are currently creating a lot of social media excitement, you know, the Impossible yeah. Foods Burger being a yeah. good example, you know, for me, that product's 99% of the way through its journey under its current owners who have quite an agenda around that product about mm. what they want it to do. The next owner, if it's probably Unilever or Nestle or one of the big food, and they'll scale it in a completely different way. Mm. And as a consequence, you know, what they'll be trying to do is make it affordable to be able to get it mm. to as many people as possible to create, an, a, you know, a strong global brand from it. So. I don't think, you know, what, what the way that those companies are going to look at it, it's about nutrition, it's about health, and it's about giving the consumer the choice that they want, and I think mm. they'll benefit from that. And you don't think trust becomes problematic when they're doing things that may be seen by some as inconsistent? Um, it may do to a small niche okay. of their consumers, yeah, yeah. but when they're trying to play to nine, you know, yep. trying to play to 100%, if you have 1% that won't buy from you, you still got 99% to play with, yeah. yeah. And Rachel, just to, to kind of expand on that a little bit, that idea that you were talking about of, of uh, labels that people put on things and associating mm. a, a trust with that, do you think that will change in the future? Do you think people will, you mentioned the, the example of organics and people uh, kind of associating organics with an idea of things being more, more nutritious or healthier, are those labels going to be questioned more in the future? I don't think, I mean, personally, I don't think most people pay attention to those labels now, to be frank. Mm. I mean, in the sense that I don't think they believe what they're supposed to be saying. So we were talking about this earlier with eggs, for example. You know, our work with eggs and, and, and Rowan's saying, you know, from their work as well. Um, people buy free-range eggs um, for a whole range of reasons, but um, caring about the welfare of chickens comes fairly down, far down the line. Mm. Um, we know from scientific evidence that free range versus conventional, or cage to be more precise, um, the nutrition profile is exactly the same, but people believe they're more nutritious. Mm. So um, I think people will continue to use them as rules of thumb at the same time as they um, completely think that they're worthless, which is again one of those wonderful inconsistencies that we as humans like to live with. Yeah. Um, it's just a shorthand way of looking for a mark of better or quality um, that may not really be about what the label is. I don't think that labeling and segmentation is going to go away. It's as you know as old as products are. Yeah. Mm. Organics is a fun, is a really interesting yeah. point at the moment because you know you look at the big retailers around the world. They really want to scale up their organic offering mm. because consumers view it as being good for them and mm. they're prepared to pay a premium for it. But the trouble is the rules we have around organic food do not make that possible because um, you know they just you cannot get to the scale that say a Walmart wants with the current rule environment. So, you know, we've got this hold up in the US at the moment on redefining what organic standards is. It's ending up in the courts. Mm. So I think you're going to end up with organic being a whole range of different levels, which will match individual consumer views around what they're happy to call an organic product. Mm. So I think, you know, that in the end, the consumer's going to win the debate again. Mm. 
But we're also seeing like the emergence of the segment of transition to organics, right? That's a that's a definite segment in the U.S. now, um, you know. And um, one of the reasons for that is they're developing new financial models um, to assist a transition to organics or the transition from conventional acres to organic, you know, which has been one of the big holdups as well, right? We've been seeing increasing demand, but we actually don't have the finance models in place to fund you know, the infrastructure change that needs to happen to meet the demand. So, you know, this is a, I think, you know, you can't kind of divorce the finance flows out of, um, and, and kind of look at just a consumer demand proposition without thinking about who's going to fund that. Mm. One more question on trust uh, from the audience. Is there a danger that focusing on the trust train means that consumer whims could dictate production systems and that in turn would actually increase your volatility? Will farmers feel they have to change their systems rather than considering some compromise? Maybe, Rowan, that would be on for you. Well, to, to be a bit glib about it, farmers don't get to choose their systems. Mm -hmm. The consumer chooses the system. and. Um, the, the trust train, I don't think, has any prospect of increasing volatility. It allows you to understand the nature of that volatility and make decisions and then invest in supporting those decisions that'll allow you to keep your infrastructure for longer. Mm. It's a process, really. Um, yeah, and, and I don't see an awful lot of uh, downside, but for the, I guess, the transparency um, issue, uh, some risks that go along with that that you flagged earlier. But it could do the reverse, right? Mm -hmm. It could, I mean, transparency can decrease volatility, right? So mm. let's just think about it in the context of price transparency. If we actually knew what the cost of everything was, is that actually going to increase volatility? No. Mm. Um, do we still want that? Do we want pricing transparency? Well, that's a whole other question mm. because we don't know what those markets look like and markets have traditionally traded due to um, information arbitrage and um, you know the, the fact that I know something different to what you or I have a different view. But um, I, th I think trust and transparency are not equivalent in this mm. discussion. Mm. 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 So that's a fair bit on trust. One word that I wanted to bring up that I haven't, we've heard just touched on a few little times that we haven't so much is the word cost and what role cost will play in the future. Because at the moment, obviously, you do have a lot of people that, uh, in a sense, probably aspirationally will buy organic. It's a little bit more, but they feel they're getting a better product. They'll buy, they'll spend a little bit more going to a butcher's shop rather than a supermarket because they might know where the meat comes from. Um, but at the same time, dollar a litre milk and dollar loaf of bread. That's very, very popular. You see a lot of people buying cheap it's cheap eggs, still buying cheap chicken. So the note of cost, and I'll open this up to the panel so whoever really wants to, to delve in on it, in the future, how do you think cost will factor into these other competing uh, desires? Uh, I think if you look at a global market, for 99% or 95% of consumers, cost is still probably going to be the first factor that will determine what they buy. Yeah. But for you know Australia, and I use the same argument when I talk in New Zealand as well, we, we are incredibly niche players in the global food system. So I think the stats this morning that you know you can feed around about 40, 45 million people with what you produce in Australia um, beyond what you need yourselves. And if you think about that, and you're talking about a global population of 9 billion, you're 1% of the global food system or, or less. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have the ability to think about where we direct our products to and therefore, you know, actually cost can be taken out of that equation if you start to think about the, the niche you want to play in because you can be targeting only at those niches where, where cost is less of an importance to the experience, the story, the trust, all those other factors that we've talked about. Mm. I think that's also why I spoke about embedded trust, right? The idea is that this does this is not an optional extra. This doesn't cost more. It's actually embedded in the way supply chain transactions happen. So that's what technology is allowing us to do. It doesn't have to be another layer that is then going to be either passed back to what traditionally are the two poles that are powerless in a supply chain, the farmer and the consumer, who then have to either accept the risk or the cost of operation. Uh, well, another question from the audience. This is to do with that idea of a personal diet. How do individual farmers tailor their products and marketing to get to a personal diet? Uh, this person goes on to say this will be an incredibly resource heavy on particularly family farming operations. Does it make it even more important for a, a local cooperation approach? Uh, well, I, I think an individual farmer will struggle to tailor to an, a specific yeah. consumer. 
But what it does mean is you need to think about as a farmer where your products are going to end up and therefore you need to have a very clear view as, as I described it, the value web of everybody that's going to be involved in actually delivering a personalised solution to the consumer. So if you have that vision, then that gives you the ability to then make, make sure that the input you're putting into the value chain is the right product to enable personalisation to occur. So, you know, if you think about a dairy company, at the moment when the dairy company picks up the milk, they pretty well put everything into single tankers and they just combine it all. But if you've got somebody that's produced grass-fed milk and somebody that's done A2 milk and, and you're, you're, you're not actually segmenting those different milk streams, you're losing a huge amount of value straight away. Mm. So it's making sure that we've got the investment in the right place to enable us to do that at the end of the value chain. Mm. Uh, now to a, a fun question that has some serious undertones. If you had $5 million, <laughs> what agribusiness, what business would you invest in? You can go first, day. Me? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Um, if I had $5 million at the moment to invest, I would um, be investing in a marketing business that is going to use big data to understand consumers mm. and uh, okay. help people direct their value to where they're going to go. And why? What do you, why do you think that would, why, why do you think that's an important because avenue I, that needs I, to go? I ultimately think every farmer is going to have to have and I'll under, a much deeper understanding of the people that they're growing their food yeah. for. And really, we need to collect an awful lot of data on consumers at a very um, granular level yeah. to start to understand that. And then you, you need to use these, these tools that are becoming available to us in terms of data and analytics to really understand and interpret that data. Yeah. So I, I think for any agricultural business, that that access to data and information is going to become core to how they're going to operate moving forward. Anyone else want to take that? I'm guessing, Rowan, you'd probably say an egg property. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I would. I don't think I can make a money for comp. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, look, uh, one other point that I was keen to talk about um, that, that Rachel mentioned was uh, that idea of large-scale large farming and some of the confusions over labelling there. Uh, there's kind of an inconsistency there, isn't there, in people wanting individual food, but also everybody at the end of the day just wants to be fed. People want to make sure that there's food security. How do you think that inconsistency will play out? I think, um, well, I think there's, there's different levels at work there, right? Yeah. So when people think about what they want for their own families or in their own household, they don't want big. But simultaneously, they want cheap, right? And not that those always go side, you know, but they, they're intertwined in many, many ways. Um, when they think about things like feeding the world and so on, they get a lot less concerned about big because it's someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. But I do think we're, we're at an interesting crossroads, um, not only thinking about you know, agriculture as a business, but also into the future, what it's going to look like as far as social responsibilities to other parts of the world and even to people here. You know, mm -hmm. our, we're not equally um, well endowed in terms of food supply and nutritional supply in this country. So I think um, the kind of myth of what big farming is is something that very actively needs to be pushed back against by farmers of all sorts and people involved in agriculture so those kind of pictures aren't what dominates. Um, currently people seem to have either one extreme or the other. You know, meet the farmer, meet the chicken who has a name, you know, we're all good friends here commercials, farmers markets, take your favorite pick, or these huge farms. Reality is a lot of it is somewhere in the middle, right? Um, and that's the vision that needs to be pushed out much more. Um, somebody asked about you know, how to bring producers into social license um, in order to sort of uh, either regain or maintain what social license there is. I think that that mid-range needs to be addressed much more clearly by Australian producers. Now, one thing we haven't talked about so far is something that's of great interest to me is uh, protein sources. We've touched on it with the idea of, um, of animal-free meat. Uh, another question through, will insect farms be a protein source in the near future? So, yeah, go. Cool. Yeah, yeah, they already are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And they're very efficient. Though. Yeah, and, and billions of people around the world eat insects as part of their diet. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, two years ago I was saying, oh, we'll all be eating insects within 10 years. We're all eating insects now. You know, mm -hmm. you can go to plenty of restaurants around and they're, they're using insect flour as an ingredient or the best restaurant in the world, Noma, has, has had its key salad with ants running around it now for ages. So, 
Yeah, I think what we need to get our minds around is actually the scale of insect farming is going to change quite dramatically. And it's, it's fascinating when you talk to some of the entrepreneurs in this area, the vision they have and the amount of money they believe that they will need to build these sort of super um, insect farms, but also, you know, how you can gear those into a, the, the whole, you know, I suppose closed loop farming system and that, you know, they, they, they're a great way to consume biomass that's, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. currently creating waste issues. But I think also, so we have some work coming out on this and some ongoing work with colleagues at Adelaide. Um, not all insect farming is the same, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the elite kind of Noma, Green Ant, Gin, take your pick, is really just very one edge of it. Where people seem to be more open to considering it is if they can't actually see it's an insect, so ground down, put into shakes, things like this. Mm. If they already are what, what's called um, neophilic, so they're already interested in trying new things, that's the market. And people interested in protein supplements are gonna be very big on it. Um, people also seem to be much less concerned about feeding it to animals. So mm. I think animal feed's sort of the wedge in if you wanna go big scale, and protein powder is the wedge in. And then eventually people will realize they've been eating it for a really long time and it can be in different forms. But certainly the most kind of um, efficient way of using it anyway is as a protein kind of supplement. Mm -hmm. And people are open to that um, if presented in a certain way. At least that's what our studies show, so far are showing. Mm -hmm. um, so as with everything, it matters what precise product. I don't think you know chocolate crickets are gonna be on school menus anytime soon. Mm -hmm. No, but there, there was a great example way or one of the big burger chains in the US um, did a insect-based protein shake and absolutely sold like hotcakes because yep. it was just high protein and yep. people mm. wanted the high protein. Yep. Mm. It's a so, huge market niche. Mm. So a bit of an either or question that probably doesn't have an either or answer, which is great fun. Uh, <laughs> if you were to say, if you were to put a bet on uh, insect or animal-free protein, animal-free meats, which do you think will be more prominent in 2030? Put the five million on the insects. <laughs> That's yeah. where the money goes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, I think animal-free protein is too caught up still. You need a big generational change. Um, I think it's too caught up in people's visions of really horrible lentil loaf from the 1970s. It's got, it's got a perception problem, right? Mm. Um, and I think insects are sort of the great unknown, and people are willing to try, so long as it fits with other values, namely health and nutrition. Yeah, um, a, and so I'd bet on the insects yeah. as well. It's interesting when you look at dairy, you know, there's a huge amount about these alternative milks, mm. as well, M Y L K. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they're, and they're growing really quickly, but they're growing at around about 2 billion litres a year at the moment. Traditional dairy from a cow is growing at about 20 billion litres a year. So, mm. you know, mm. the, 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 the consumer demand is still very much towards the traditional protein at the moment. Mm. Mm. Uh, one more final question to end on. Uh, what are the th panel's thoughts on an organisation such as PETA, the Animal Welfare Group, and the role that they will play in farmers gaining trust in society? Mm. Well, they're already, already playing a, a role. They're, they're vocal. There's a range of activist organisations that are in the mix. Um, you can't wish them away or ask them to be quiet. Um, so you've just got to you know, place your bets and, and, and put your energy and your resources into a genuine engagement that will hopefully shine through. Um, it's funny talking about traceability and, and what trust means. I'm a very simple person and uh, I, I see trust through uh, the prism of narratives and that is um, what's in the box should be what it says is in the box on the outside. <laughs> I think if you take that premise and extend it right through ag agri agricultural supply chains, you'll build genuine trust. Peter will always have a perspective and as will many, many other voices. Um, but you'll find there are consumers um, that are highly interested in uh, quality, credible sources of information. And there's other perspective. If you want to be cre have credibility, just be more credible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think if everyone took that approach in the agriculture sector, you'd round up all those other voices pretty quickly. And I think, um, so again, this is something we've got a great um, PhD student studying activism um, and the role in animal welfare um, discussions. And we find a lot of consumers are very skeptical about explicitly activist groups and they have their spectrum. Most people are pretty happy with the RSPCA and then they have their spectrum sort of down the line. And that leaves a lot of space for producers to, to jump in and say precisely what they are doing without needing the mediation of activist groups. I think they have a role, 
um, obviously cruelty to animals, violations of animal welfare standards, all those things, extremely important. But producers have been really scared of that space. And so I really agree, I think, with what Rowan's saying. It is a space that needs to be retaken and together with some of those groups to try to come up with, not, if not a middle road, at least a transparent way of expressing the issues that are out there and why there is disagreement. And then consumers are going to make their choices. Mm -hmm. But currently, it's, it's a bit shock jock kind of publicity. Mm -hmm. um, but, but part of what's occurring because of that, consumers are just recoiling from that because they've stopped believing a lot of it because mm -hmm. they think it's fake. You know, so it's a troubled space at the moment. I agree with you, Rachel. I think there is a spectrum, but one of the areas that we see there almost is a kind of a, a universality, and that is around support for farmers, and particularly yes. our farmers in Australia and farming. And you know, we really see kind of a, a deep convergence of um, values and ethics um, for all different types of reason around supporting our farmers, um, which I think is you know really exciting for farmers to take that and run with that going forward. Yes. And so there we go, we end up where we started, talking about trust and trust being an incredibly important thing now and into the future. So one of the many messages uh, coming through from our panel. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. Thank you for sending them all through. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel.